It's the Chinese New Year season, so let's kick things off in the festive spirit tonight. And what better way to do that than talking about wine? After a dip in demand last year, Chinese consumers are back buying bottles, both red and white, with great enthusiasm. As the country's wealth continues to rise, so too, it seems, does its taste for the finer things in life. And as CCTV's Jane Lee found out, the Chinese are not just buying wine, they're making it, learning about it, and also investing in it too. An acquired taste. The standard of living in China is soaring, and with it a taste for foreign luxuries, such as wine. The Chinese have long been known for their fine food and love of fine food. Now it seems they've found a perfect companion. These days, lots of people are trying out pairing wine with Chinese food, and the results have been very good. Greasy, spicy and heavy foods are less preferable, especially now that people are more health conscious. So local food will go better with wine too. Most Chinese wine drinkers opt for red wine. After all, red is considered a lucky color. I remember in 2009, when the restaurant first opened, customers who ordered wine were mostly foreigners. But in the last two to three years, more and more local customers at Yazhou order and drink red wine. So I think more Chinese people in the future will start to like red wine. The rise of China's more sophisticated middle class has sent the boost market skyrocketing in recent years. Chinese nationals are investing in vineyards around the world, and the country became the world's biggest consumer of wine in 2013. But wine imports dropped last year for the first time in China's modern history, following a series of anti-corruption measures by President Xi Jinping shortly after taking office. Imports of still wine went from a staggering 50 to 70 percent year-on-year growth to just 5 percent in 2013, then, they contracted in the first half of 2014. There was probably no other market in the world where you could probably safely say that 20 or 30 percent of, of wine that was imported into the country was either directly or indirectly related to some form of government entertainment, government gifting, all that sort of stuff. Um, clearly, that market has now completely evaporated. But since then, the wine market has started to stabilize. Customs figures earlier this month showed that imports have actually risen by 1.9 percent from 2013. Experts are confident that it won't take long for China to regain the top spot as the world's largest consumer of wine, and winemakers are jostling to get a slice of the market. But are the Chinese really falling in love with wine, or is the demand for wine just a hype? Another trend is bubbling up beneath the surface, Chinese-made wines. China now ranks as the world's seventh largest wine producer. Internationally acclaimed Chinese wines still remain few and far between, but the thirst for fine wine has propelled more local Chinese to explore ways of making quality wines. When a Chinese wine produced in northwest China's Ningxia region won Decanter magazine's international trophy for the first time in 2011, the news was met with shock and skepticism. Wang Fang, who started her own winery in Ningxia, said her greatest challenge other than a harsh winter was strong consumer bias. Everyone is biased towards foreign wines. Of course, this is a challenge for all Chinese winemakers, but especially for Ningxia because it's an inland region and it's less prosperous. So for it to produce such a high-end product is proof that Ningxia can produce great wines. But consumer awareness is growing, with some Chinese taking classes to better understand wine. I believe that most people don't actually understand it, so there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding red wine. But more and more people are earnestly learning about it, such as myself. Though this is not my field, I've already passed level two of the English Wine and Spirit Education Trust. There are still hurdles in the industry, which wine companies in China are working hard to overcome. But hyped up or not, China's potential, with 37 million adults turning the drinking age in the next five years, remains promising. Jane Li, CCTV, Beijing. The wine culture in China, the Chinese are fascinated about it. For more on the wine market and the wine culture, we're joined in our Beijing studio by Ms. 
Doreen Chang. She is a national education director of ASC Fine Wines. She's one of China's ups and coming wine expert. Welcome to our program. Meanwhile, in our studio, we also have Miss Feng Yi Walker, director of the Dragon Phoenix Wine Consultants in Beijing. Very Chinese name, I guess. <laughs> uh, in London, we have uh, Richard Hostad, the managing director of Wine Intelligence a market research organization focusing on global wine industry. Welcome to our program. Happy Spring Festival to all of you. And we are talking about one of the most interesting topics, I think, facing Chinese consumers these days, wine. How much, really, are the Chinese in China embracing the Western wine and the wine culture? Feng Yi, you want to go first? Sure, I'll step right up to that question. And okay. I think it's a very good question because what do we look at to decide this? Are we looking at consumption? Are we looking at importation? No matter what we look at though, I think it's very clear that more and more Chinese are drinking wine as a regular thing. Mm. They're enjoying it. They're going out and they're learning about wine or they're opening different bottles. We certainly see this. We. When it comes to food and beverages, Chinese are never afraid of anything. <laughs> exactly. Not to even mention it's as something as wonderful as wine. And Doreen, probably you can help us with some of the numbers. In fact, how many Chinese in China are consuming wine on a regular basis? How much of it is actually imported? How much of it is actually domestically produced? Well, for the uh, imported wines, only accounts of uh, about about uh, twenty percent of the total import. Uh, but Chinese people uh, normally have a, a wine drinking as a, a drinking culture. But it has a long history of drinking uh, uh, Chinese spirits in the past. But we have seen a lot of uh, changes now for the recent years, uh, particularly I'm doing a wine education, I've seen a lot of changes with my class uh, class students. Uh, in the past, a lot of expats and foreigners coming to my classes, but nowadays we see uh, more consumers, wine lovers, doctors or teachers coming to our classes. Mm -hmm. So we have seen a, a big uh, phenomenon in the, in the Chinese market. Well, I guess those classrooms are always full? Always full, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder about that, because a study has really found that in the year 2013, China already overtook France and Italy as the world's largest consumer of red wine, at least. Consumption in China almost tripled between the year 2007 and the year 2013. Well, it fell 18% in France and almost 6% in Italy. Still, on per capita basis, the Chinese drink far less wine though than their European counterparts. China drank about 1.5 liters per person in the year 2013 compared with 52 liter average in France. Well, about that, I'm sure Mr. Hostad uh, from the wine intelligence, you must have known all of these numbers. Really, how much Chinese are embracing this wine culture? What exactly is wine to them in their life? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I mean, I would agree with the other panelists that we've really seen a revolution over the past 10 years mm. um, in wine in China, and that revolution has still got a long way to go. Um, wine was a drink that definitely had a place in society for a long time in, in China, but it wasn't a particularly everyday drink. I think what we're seeing now is the emergence of what we're describing as wine 2.0, <laughs> um, which is uh, a consumer marketplace mm. which is starting to behave more like uh, the more mature markets that we're seeing elsewhere in the world. Perhaps not as mature as, say, France, which has had a wine drinking culture for hundreds of years, um, but perhaps closer to some of the more newer wine markets and uh, you know, some of the English speaking markets and, and some of the markets in uh, parts of the world that right. traditionally didn't have uh, a strong wine drinking culture. Well, even though it's only one, two point. 2.0, we see already a lot of Chinese the new or rich are setting their eyes and their pockets on the wine. For example, according to Sotheby, by the year 2014, autumn auction, about two thirds of those that are bidding for the most expensive wine slot actually are Asian. And most of them, in fact, are coming from China's mainland. So, uh, Mr. Hostad, what do you think about this phenomenon? Is wine really have become an important part of China's food and beverage, or actually it is a way of showing your status 
and showing how much rich you have become. Well, I think wine and status are very closely entwined in many cultures, and I and I think China is no different. Um, there's a particular emphasis on it um, at the moment, or has been, because the way that wine has come into the public consciousness is mainly through very high-profile public. Uh, social events. So, for instance, spring festivals、right. when people may be toasting each other with with wine, and those are the moments where you want to show, you know, good face to the world, to to the world around you.、Um, and spending a lot of money on your friends, on your family,、right. is is a great way to do that. Well, you're talking about actually two different things. One is about whether it is about status.、Mm. The other thing is whether it's about face. Those it's a little bit different, I would say.、Um, Feng Yi, what do you think? What is really behind China's wine culture? The motivation. Ah,、oh, well, there's so many facets to the Chinese <laughs> wine culture, isn't there?、Um, but we can say from one side, these very rich consumers, that. It is a matter of lending them face, being able to pay for such wines, but it's also taste. You know, a lot of、Absolutely. them started drinking. You know, quite a few years ago, they got used to drinking very expensive wine. They've continued doing that. I think what's also interesting is that we're seeing another wine culture emerge that is, shall we say, more every day. That people also enjoy drinking with their friends, their colleagues, in an everyday way. But I think what happens is that. Gradually, these two are sort of coming together,、mm. and I think we'll all end up at. I hope we will all end up at this beautiful position, where we can all enjoy wine culture, but we can also just enjoy the beauty of drinking wine. If people want to buy the more expensive wine, they will, and if they want to drink the, shall we say, more value for money wine,、um, they'll also be, feel free enough. To express their own tastes and opinions, to do that exactly. On the other hand, it is not just about how much how big the market is and what is really behind this market. It's also what exactly this culture is about. Whether Chinese are, in a way, embracing the part of the culture behind the wine.、Mm-hmm. Um, therefore, I would like to go to you, Doreen, because many of your students are common Chinese,、mm-hmm. and they want to know what is really behind this culture. Usually, how, what kind of question they would ask you? Uh, about the culture, the wine culture, and do you think that they adjust themselves so that they will become a very qualified, qualified, shall I say, a, a connoisseur even of wine?、Mm-hmm. Uh, when people come to my classes, first thing they want to、uh, learn how to appreciate wines from the very beginning,、right. and they want to,、uh, they don't want to lose face in front of their friends or、uh, when they,、uh, they invite. They need to know all the brands, they <laughs>、right. need to know all the names,、yeah. even though how hard it is to remember.、Huh? Yeah, that's why we create a different co- level of courses for different people.、Right. Uh, so every time they come to class, most of the,、uh, ask the question will be, how do I choose a bottle of wine when I go to a retail shop? And well, would you, what would you say? I, I say the more you drink, the more you learn. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> That seems to be a perfect answer. <laughs> yeah, and also、uh, we have seen a lot of、uh, people are buying wines online nowadays.、Mm-hmm. It's more very convenient.、Uh, people are using、uh, smartphones with the、uh, apps,、mm-hmm. so the, it's very very convenient way of learning、uh, wines as well. Some of my friends really do that. They go. Wherever the shop is, and they take pictures of the wine, and they use that app to figure out what exactly is the name, what's、yeah. the background behind it. It's a very difficult task to go shopping with them, as you may understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very long process. But let me come back to you, Feng Yi,、um, just to understand this, because how much of a culture,、uh, when it comes to beverages, is has a lot to do with how people are looking at it、mm-hmm. and what kind of emotions they want to. Express through them. For example, in Chinese ancient culture, you are a majoring in Chinese classic Chinese. You understand this? The poems, the prose, a lot of them were done only after the writers took in a lot of Chinese hard liquor.、Uh, but has wine, the so-called Western wine, become an important part of China's emotion? At this moment, probably that would help us to understand how much China is embracing the wine culture. Yes, I think that's a very, very interesting point because when we do see Chinese culture and people drinking, it's often to dispel worries, to aid creation, to sort of, and and also for health. 
I mean, after all, right. there's a long history in China of drinking for health. And I think Western Rituals wine... Rituals to heal, heal and to express concerns, you know. Exactly. And I think, actually, quite a lot of that comes into the Western wine culture that we see, not necessarily, I think, rituals. I think we, we sort of given up on that one. But I think if we look at, first of all, health, mm. a lot of people take up red wine drinking for health and also to dispel worries. It's a little bit different in that perhaps now it's a more casual way rather than of doing the very formal toasting, mm. that you can use wine in a more sort of casual, social way, right. particularly with colleagues. So right. I think it passes on. You haven't answered my question. Oh. I'm really asking about whether it has become part of our literature, part of ah. our emotions, part of a way to express ourselves. Let me just read to you, Mr. Hallstatt, uh, uh, a quote from a very important uh, Tang poet, uh, Wang Han, his poem about uh, Chinese wine. He said this, they are about to drink the finest wine from the evening radiance cups when the sudden sounding of pipa urges them forth. This is a part of a poem written in the Tang Dynasty talking about soldiers on the battleground enjoy themselves a little bit with the Chinese wine before they go back again onto the battlefield. So, so many examples of these in Chinese classical literatures. So let me ask you, Mr. Haas, that do you think these part of Ch the culture about wine has really that much emerged into the Chinese culture as the classical Chinese <laughs> wine had over thousands of years? <laughs> Well, I'm not a China scholar, so I won't <laughs> even touch that, that particular part of the question. What I can tell you is that the, the culture of today, which you know, we, we know is, is very much a smartphone culture, a, a culture of information and, mm. and of knowledge and, and using that knowledge as part of your status, mm. I think that very, very closely aligns with where wine is, not just in China, but, but everywhere. Mm. Um, and I think it's a very exciting subject for consumers at the moment. Um, it's an, a relatively accessible way of understanding another culture by drinking the wine from that culture and right. learning a bit about it. Um, you don't have to visit France to appreciate of French course. wine and appreciate also the French way of doing things. But on the other hand, how much will the Chinese liquor if we're talking about the wine coming from the West coming into China, but what about the other way around? Do you think there's likely to be stronger interest about the Chinese liquor, usually the Chinese heart liquor, you would take it with a shot. And sometimes there's also going to be competitions around the dinner table <laughs> of uh, how much you drink. But how about that wine yes. culture? And how about that Chinese type of heart liquor and wine? Is it likely to go to the West? What do you think is the possibility, Mr. Hallstatt? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, the Chinese liquor is, is very much an acquired taste for, for a Westerner um, and I think it will probably find uh, its way into international markets more in the future because people in other markets are interested in different tastes and different styles. Mm. You see that with um, South American liquors, with uh, uh, liquor from other parts of Asia. So I think that Chinese hard liquor will probably start to become more available in mm. other markets. I don't think it's going to take over. Right. Well, the wine question is perhaps more more, more of a, uh, a pertinent one for, for our discussion, absolutely. which is there's some amazing developments going on in China, which your package alluded to in terms of winemaking skill. There's some great winemakers working in China. They're discovering new ways of, of making mm. some world class wines. I think that that's only going to continue. Um, and uh, I think there will be uh, a place for you know Chinese wine, not perhaps as a sort of mainstream product that you would find in a but shop. But people will certainly London, want to try um, it. Uh, certainly, in the supermarket. yeah. Uh, but but uh, Feng Yi, let me ask you: What do you think? Because Chinese winemaking history, if I could talk to you, because yeah. you are really majoring in Chinese ancient history and classics dates back to the 200 BC. Mm -hmm. Throughout the years, you see the Tang Dynasty, you see the uh, Yuan Dynasty, even later, after China was colonized in the 19th century, winemaking history still continued, but on a very smaller scale. Will winemaking, Western style, become part of real Chinese culture 
in the future. Talk about Ningxia, for example, as we're showing in our background. Talk about Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, for example, where they are all rich with grapes productions. Oh, the grapes from there are marvelous! I remember eating them the first time I was studying in Beijing. <laughs> I'm getting mouth-watering at the moment when we talk about it. So, what about the future? What about the potential? I think there's great potential for Chinese wine, and I've got to say, I think I started sort of judging Chinese wine about six years ago. It's improved year on year. We still have a long way to go because. First of all, China is not the ideal place to grow grapes.、Mm. We freeze in winter, we sweat in summer. Most of the country. Yeah, the poor grapes are also uncomfortable. There's a lot of costs involved in taking care of them. However, having said that, there's the will, there's the determination, there's also a really, really great emerging wine culture. I go to Ningxia regularly to do research. And the first thing they want to do is have a big meeting to talk about how they can get better,、mm. how they can improve. And then I always go, "You have to drink more wine. You have to drink all these international styles, and then you can understand how to best express the wine of your area." And I see it getting better and better every year, and I hope that、uh, it will improve to a vast extent, and we can export. What、it. is the most crucial <laughs> point that you think they need to improve? There's very briefly.、Uh, I will try and not be technical here,、mm. but one of the most important things they need to improve is planting a variety of grape vines that are healthy. I see. This is a very big challenge because everyone had heard of Cabernet Sauvignon, Chirchajul, very nice Chinese name, and so they all planted that. Is it necessarily the best grape? I see. We've yet to find There's out. There needs to be more width of knowledge and information exactly. about exactly it, it what's happening in the industry. On the other hand, what do you think about the wine coming from China? Is it likely to satisfy the taste and the tongue of the Chinese, or Chinese are more likely to embrace more international brands and big names? Well,、uh, according to the conception,、uh, we have just talked about it. So only 20% of wine are consumed are imported wines. However, in terms of the taste, I think people when uh, I think uh, uh, there are four important things when uh, uh, a, a successful a brand can be successfully be、uh, in in China, which is、uh, you know the pricing will be right pricing. Yeah. The product、mm-hmm. you have to be taste good. Of course. People have to.、Mm-hmm. And the third, the third one will be a positioning.、Yeah. How you segmentation your your、uh, your product, and and the the, the last one will be、uh, PR promotion. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of requirements over、yeah. over over there. But、yeah. uh, we are very happy to talk to you on the Spring Festival. The wine in China and the Chinese are appreciating coming from the West. Thank you so much for being with us, Doreen Tang, Feng Yi Walker. And also Richard Hostad. Thank you so much for being with us. Cheers. 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 <laughs>